So date this 17th? 17th. Okay. 17th of December, 2010? 10. Okay. So, just some simple questions to start off. Uh, when's your birthday? Uh, 5, 10, 46. Okay. And, um... I'm 84 years old. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, when, where were you born? I was born in Rockford, Illinois. And did you, like, grow up there? Yes. I went through, uh, high school, but, uh... Because the war was on and the bridge club decided that uh, my mother belonged to, that I should get out of high school a half a year early. Oh. Because I was a midterm. Mm -hmm. So I got out of high school a half a year early because I had enough credits. Oh, wow. Which allowed me to get a year at Purdue University before I was drafted. Um, and what year were you drafted? I was drafted in 1944. 1944. Did you uh, go to college before that, or you just went? No, I, yeah, I, that's what I was telling you. Oh. I graduated in high school in 43. Mm -hmm. And then because Purdue was on a three year, three times a year setup, I started in Purdue in November. Oh, okay. And ran through June. And then right after June of 44, I was drafted. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, did you go to a, like, training camp? Yes, I was in uh, infantry basic uh, a replacement training camp. Um, and I was there. It was a 17-week course. Mm -hmm. But during that time, because I had one year of college, I had taken differential equations. Okay. And to take a test, to go back to college, you had to have differential equations. So I took the test, and uh, and when I was standing with my pack on my back, getting ready to go on bivouac, uh, four of us out of a thousand were called out, and we were put on a train to Morgantown, West Virginia, oh. and where I went to West Virginia University, studying electrical engineering. Down. And I was I was there through VE and VJ day. Oh, okay. Now, since 13 of the kids in my company were from Rockford, Illinois, later on I was able to find out where they went. Mm -hmm. One of them was killed and another one was has been in a VA hospital. But basically the ones I talked to, they ended up as replacement in the Battle of the Bulge. Oh. But, of course, I didn't because I went to West Virginia University. <laughs> right. So, uh... Um, did you get to choose what you got to study? Or no. did they tell you? No, they told me I was going to study electrical engineering. Did you enjoy it? Or was I, it I was going to be an engineer anyhow, an aeronautical <laughs> engineer or something, so... Uh, because I was good in math. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any troubles. And, uh... So uh, I uh, enjoyed the, the mm -hmm. electrical engineering. So when I came out of there, uh, why then they sent me for uh, discharge to Camp Crowder, Missouri, where I was kind of working as a clerk oh. until a major and a captain came through looking for these electrical engineers they had trained. I did not graduate, mm -hmm. so don't get me wrong. Okay. Uh, but they were looking for people to go out on the V-2 rocket oh. in Alamor Gordo, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those that was picked to go out and do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, did Were you there when the atomic bomb was being worked on there? or? Yeah, when was the atomic bomb? In 45? Was it 45? Yeah, 45. Yeah, it must have been in 45. Uh, well, the question was, was I... Um, were you, like, around there when... Did you hear anything about the atomic bomb, like, while you were there? Yeah, that, the atomic bomb and VE Day and VJ Day were while I was at, at West Virginia University. Oh, okay. 
So I was there with all, all three of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, for the V twos, like, what did you do, like, for them? Well, in the V two, if you could track the get several points on on a V two rocket that had been shot, mm -hmm. it has a parabolic curve. So if you know you get three quick points here, you can pretty well predict where it's going to land. Okay. And that was the purpose of it. And so they had radar groups out in the field. Mm -hmm. But I ended up transmitting scientific information back to New Jersey on the receiver of a transmission set. Oh. That was my job. Um, how would you, would you send it over... Well, they didn't have computers. No, wireless. Wireless? Yeah. We had a big wireless setup. Oh. And they transmitted into New Jersey that way. Okay. And they were labs in New Jersey run by the government. Oh, okay. You know, the military. Mm -hmm. Um, Growing up in a depression, like, what was it like for you? Was it... Well, um, I really didn't have strong feelings because... Uh, you know, when you looked around, everybody was in the same boat. Mm -hmm. You know, we did have friends who were on WPA, but we would go over and get wonderful food from them that the government would give them that we was better than the food we could buy in the store type thing, like uh, apples or oranges or things like that. Uh, but as far as not having any money, I was one of the lucky ones because my father was a traveling salesman and he was able to make a co enough on commissions mm -hmm. that uh, we had enough to eat and uh, clothes and we so we didn't suffer that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the only uh, choose the right word here, uh, thing of the depression was that we were in a small house mm -hmm. that was okay for five people because I had two sisters and myself and mm -hmm. my mother and dad and we ended up with my grandmother and my uncle and his son. So the three of us males slept in one bedroom and the three females in another and mm -hmm. my folks in another. So in a very small house that was the only right. thing in depression mm -hmm. was and it wasn't too bad either because my own oh, one uncle was on was a traveling salesman oh, okay. and he was gone most of the time. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. did your sisters take part in the war effort anyway? No. No. Neither um, one. What about the uh the son of your uncle, your, what was that, your yes, cousin? Yes, he was in the Battle of Bull. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um, do you still talk to him, or is he... No, he's deceased. Oh, I'm sorry. But, yes, he was, uh, but to answer your question, he was more like a brother than, because uh, I had no brothers. Right. So he was the best man at my wedding, and, oh. and uh, he, he was, up until he passed away, you know, uh, more like a brother mm -hmm. to me than my brother who was born 18 years okay. later. Right. Um, so. Did you, how did you meet your wife? Was it during the war? Or? No, I met her at Purdue when I was a freshman. Oh. Yeah, she went looking for a younger man who could take care of her in her old age. <laughs> so, that's the situation we're in today. <laughs> um. And well, we children. met at Purdue, and then we got married when I in '47 when I came out. Mm -hmm. You know. Um. Do you in, do you have children? We have five. Oh. Five children. We have four boys and a girl. Mm -hmm. One boy lives in Southland Falls, one in Albany, one in Kentucky, and one in Ohio. Oh. We have an only daughter who's the fifth one, and she spent 28 years in Texas and her husband retired and they moved about eight minutes away. Oh, how nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's it's been nice to have her back and mm -hmm. it's been wonderful to have. Um, when you were, 
like in the military, like you made friends, obviously. Uh, do you still are you in contact with any of them still? Uh, no. 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 Um. I was just in a big hurry to get out. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, when they talked about, you know, going in the reserves or something like that. I wasn't the least bit in it. <laughs> Uh, for, like, during that time, uh, German scientists were being, like, captured. Were they around when you were at, um, in New Mexico at all? Well, that was very interesting because, question, mm -hmm. because one of my assignments late one evening was to take a young gentleman out to White Sands Proving Grounds where they shot off the rockets, mm -hmm. and that man turned out to be a fellow named Werner von Braun. Was um, that unusual to you? Yeah. <laughs> well, Werner von Braun was the brains behind the V-2 rocket in Germany. Oh. And he was, uh, he came over here and they had him as a consultant on the V-2 and he was the guy I took out there. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't say much on the way out. I don't even know if he could speak English, <laughs> you know, because he was from Germany. Right. I'm, I'm sure he could speak English, mm -hmm. but, uh, but we didn't have a conversation. So. But it was interesting that I was the guy that yeah. had to drive him out. And I knew who he was. Mm -hmm. so. um, yeah. I was thinking how, you, you said he came over as a consultant, how would they, I would have thought they'd make him prisoners or something, how would they make them willing? No, no, this was after the war. Oh, after the war. Oh. Yeah, this is when the Russians, you remember the Russians were able to put a bigger rocket up? Mm -hmm. Well, that's because they were able to capture that portion of the rocket situation, which was the big rockets. Okay. And most of the scientists in that preferred to get captured by the the United States, and then after the war, why they were they were brought over a lot of them like him to help us on on the V two rocket. So, um, so did you for the V two rockets? Like you didn't get to like work with them at all. You just like you didn't like shoot them no, off or anything. But I was able to go out two or three times and watch them shoot it off. Oh, you did? Yeah. That'd, so. be, that'd be so cool. Um. Like for like a size perspective, like I'm just curious, how like how big would you say they were? Um, like uh, oh, five stories. Really? Oh yeah. Wow. I mean, you've seen the rockets that go off at Cape Canaveral. Mm -hmm. Well, they were some oh, of those were that? almost that size. Oh wow. They didn't have living quarters or anything in mm -hmm. them, you know, because they were a rocket just for destroying right. purposes. But uh, they were they were quite tall. Hmm. So, um, you were around for about the Cold War then, like. Yes. Um, did you have any instances with, like, I don't know how to word. In regarding to the Cold right. War. Right. Uh, not really. I guess our only. Uh, thing we had was uh, in my job uh, I traveled all over the world and I, I was able to take my wife six times into Europe and three oh. times to the Far East while I was on company business. Of course, mm -hmm. she played while I was on company business. Oh. But uh, one time uh, they actually we had a plant that was right on the east-west border. Mm -hmm. And so they took us over to uh, this village that was across the line in East Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a sight that was unbelievable. I mean, sewer was running down the ditches. And, uh, it was just mayhem over mm -hmm. there as compared to the West German side. And by the way, we got the same experience going from Finland to Russia. Oh, really? Yeah, the Finnish were all beautiful fields and well kept, and the houses were well kept. And the minute you crossed into the Russian, over into Russia, it was a mess. 
you know, the houses were dilapidated, the mm -hmm. uh, fields were unplowed. Uh, mm -hmm. it just, I mean, you just couldn't believe the difference right. in three miles, you know? Yeah. Um, so you went to Europe, like, often? I went to, I had to go to Europe twice a year. Oh. For 22 years. Oh, wow. Um, when you were over in Germany, did you ever, like, feel not, like, that you shouldn't be there, or? No. You felt comfortable? No, I, I was very, we bought, uh, well, what I was doing, what I was doing was, I was vice president of purchasing mm -hmm. for a company that made printing ink and pigments. Oh, okay. Like Hercules. Remember Hercules here? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, they used to make pigments, and I used to buy them from them. Oh. So I knew the Hercules people real well. Same was in Germany. I bought a lot of aluminum in Germany mm -hmm. for making printing plates to print newspapers and books and so forth. And the that aluminum in large 10,000-pound coils were shipped from three outfits in Germany and an outfit in Italy and people in South Korea and mm -hmm. Japan, Taiwan. Wow. So those were the raw material because the United States had for hazardous waste mm -hmm. driven those things overseas. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, yeah, that was December 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a Sunday. Yeah. Uh, I was home, uh, how old was I? I was 15. Oh, wow. At that time, in 41. Uh, I was just home. Mm -hmm. You know, listening to the radio and uh, probably reading the Sunday paper <laughs> until I heard the news. Right. And so you were still in high school then? Yes. So it did it like affect you or were you still kind of not really sure about what was happening? I, I guess a lot of that kind of stuff, I'm not the type of guy to get affected, mm -hmm. you know, emotionally or, or anything like that. So... Uh, I'm kind of a guy that takes it as it comes and lives mm -hmm. with it. Uh, and uh, in regard to that, I knew it was going to get us into the war mm -hmm. right away, even at my age. Right. But that was also, you know, three years before I'd be old enough to go in the mm -hmm. Army. Right. So I didn't know what would happen in those three years. Mm -hmm. so, um, nor did I take courses in high school to get out a half a year early. Right. It just happened. I took enough courses that I had enough credits to graduate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, when you were in high school, did you have a lot of friends that ended up going off to war like while you were still there? Um, none of my close friends went uh, there was one that uh, he was a more a friend because his mother and my mother played bridge together for 35 years, oh. uh, and he ended up being a major general. Oh, and he lives down in Pennsylvania now. Oh, wow. And the interesting thing is that he married a girl that I went to school with. Oh, you know she was in my class all through junior high school and. Mm -hmm the two years I was with that class in high school. Mm -hmm. So, um, When you were in New Mexico, was there a lot of um, like radiation going on? No, we no. never talked about it. Or We were on the V-2 rocket, so right. we didn't. Right. We weren't at Los Alamos, we were at White Sands Proving Ground, okay. which was down near El Paso, Texas. Oh, okay. We were about 63 miles from El Paso, so uh, it was an Air Force base, mm -hmm. and then you went from there out to White Sands Proving Ground. So, uh, 
Two. Okay. Did you? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did you work with the actual um, mechanics behind the workings of the V two, or just tracking them? No, we were just tracking them through radar stations that were out in the field to pick up these points. You know, the radar stations picked up the V two as it took off, and then there was a big layout there at Alamogordo where they tracked it and then they would try to predict on a topography thing similar to what Adirondack uh, Museum has up at their place. Mm -hmm. uh, it looked just like that, oh. only much bigger. And, and they would then predict where from light sands to where that thing was going to land. And it was, it was for those kind of reasons to warn the civilians. Mm -hmm. uh, if the V-2 rocket came near them. So, and the war was, was, was over with at that time, but they mm -hmm. were still doing it, you know. Um, how long was like your average day working in um, New Mexico? In New Mexico? Yeah. Well, uh, we had master sergeants and staff sergeants that were running the radar things out in the field, out mm -hmm. in the desert. And of course they had to work day and night out there while well, they would come in and sleep in the barracks at night. Uh, whereas we, the three of us that were running the transmission, the receiving, and running where it was all put together, mm -hmm. The three of us uh, uh, had to quit our job at three o'clock because we were two hours behind New Jersey and New Jersey was oh. run by civilians and the civilians quit at five o'clock. <laughs> so at three o'clock we would get off and go swimming. Oh. <laughs> but the master sergeants got wind of that <laughs> and because we were just a bunch of privates they really got upset. <laughs> And so the end result was we had to spend one day, instead of going swimming, we had to clean our hut and so forth. But the next day we went back swimming. <laughs> True story. <laughs> True story. Um, but uh, we, we had it pretty, pretty easy because, because of that time delay, you know, where we couldn't transmit anymore. Um, after you got the war was over, did you go back to finish college? Yes. Uh, where did you finish it, or was it back Purdue. at Purdue? I went back to Purdue. Uh, I was in engaged to my wife, mm -hmm. and uh, she was she had graduated in '46, which is the year I got out, mm -hmm. and she had agreed to teach for two years in. Uh, a place called Chiribusco, uh, Indiana, and she was a home ec phys ed teacher. Mm -hmm. So uh, she went up there and uh, we dated the first year and uh, interestingly enough when I was in the army and she was going to college we had an agreement that even though we were planning to get married that she would be able to date in college and not miss any dances or anything like that. Oh. And uh, which she did. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we came back while well, she was up there and uh, we dated for that year and then between 46 and 1947 in the summer, June 15th, we got married. Mm -hmm. So my last year at Purdue well, as a senior was as a, you know, a married man. Mm -hmm. And she continued, because she had agreed to teach for two years, she continued to teach at Cherubusco and finished that. And then I looked for a job and ended up, uh, that was interesting because uh, I had taken a test. This might be of interest mm -hmm. to some of your I had taken a VA test that showed what you, 
it was an aptitude test, you know, or a, a things you like test, more than it was anything else. And I scored extremely high in engineer in uh, in business, and very high in engineering. So uh, I was thinking of going to Indiana University to take up business, mm -hmm. but I was also teaching as a, an assistant in at Purdue. Mm -hmm. I was teaching electrical engineering to non-electrical engineers, you know, civil engineers, mm -hmm. mechanical and that. And uh, so I had a lab that I had to help a guy with, and he was a former manager of Raytheon Tube. And uh, when I went to him and told him I was thinking of going to Indiana University, uh, he said, uh, Dick, don't do that. And I said, why not? And he said, look it. He said, you're not having any trouble with electrical engineering. And uh, he said, what you want to do is finish your electrical engineering, be a technical man, mm -hmm. and uh, take uh, business classes as your electives in your senior year like business law and accounting mm -hmm. and that things sort of, instead of electrical engineering classes. And then when people come through looking for business people and engineers, ask them if they got anything that combines the two. And interestingly enough, Union Carbide came through and being a chemical company, they were looking for technical fellows to go into purchasing. Now, I had no idea what purchasing looked like, none whatsoever, mm -hmm. never even thought about it. So I, when I was coming out of electrical engineering, I didn't know what I wanted to do, <laughs> okay? And here I am, 22 years old and uh, without any knowledge. So, uh, but they did agree to put me through a training program up in Niagara Falls, New York. Mm -hmm at their metallurgical plant where I could go through every department except the marketing department which wasn't there. But that would give me a feel for was there anything else I would like better. Mm -hmm. And I did that for two years and then they shipped me around because they started training me to be a commodity buyer in New York which is where I ended up. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, I'm saying that for the benefit of these students who have no idea what they want to be, to let them know that back in the 40s there were guys just like that. You know, and that's how we, but taking the test and talking with people was, uh, was really a lifesaver because I loved it. What I did, I loved. Uh, when you attended college, was it um, paid for by the GI Bill? Yes. It was? Yes, I was paid for by the GI Bill, and then when I worked for the, they, that was 81 more dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I had to have board and room at Purdue, but I was what we called a co-op student. That's where I met my wife. She was in Novadale Co-op, and I was in Luma Co-op. And we had trade dinners just like fraternities mm -hmm. and sororities did. Oh. And I got her at a trade dinner. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, but it was a, like it would cost you $75 a month to be in a fraternity. Mm -hmm. It only cost me $30 a month to be in a co-op house. So, uh, mm -hmm. and I was in the co-op house the first year. I was there. Mm -hmm. So I came back to the same one. Oh, oh. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that was, uh, so I was making $81 a month teaching those classes. And uh, then on top of that, I got a, the well, last year I got a married man's pay, mm -hmm. you know, and my wife was making something like $325 a month teaching school. But she had to pay board and room up where she was. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to leave because she had agreed to teach for two years. Right. Um, in high school, did you ever 
have to do like drills? Like if I was in ROTC in high school. Oh. You don't have that around here. No. Do we? Yeah, we do more, doesn't it? Do we? ROTC. I don't know what it stands for. Uh, Reserve Officers Training Corps. We we had it. I, I was in it for two and a half years. I was in in high school. Oh. But that also, when I went to, you had to take it for two years at Purdue. But because I had had it in high school, at the end of the first year, I was allowed to drop it. Mm. So, uh, but we did have ROTC. It was a field field artillery outfit. So then, um, after you were drafted, what kind of drills did you do, and did you get out of anything because you had already been in the ROTC? No, it had no effect. No effect <laughs> at all. <laughs> Nothing. No, I, I mean they didn't recognize uh -huh. the ROTC at all. Uh, <laughs> the only place it would have come into play is when I graduated. I could have gone to the reserves and gone to office training. Mm -hmm because of being a college student and having an ROTC. But, because uh, that's what it's called, a Reserve Officers Training mm -hmm. Corps. But, uh, it didn't, in the Army, that was just rugged training to be an infantryman. How do you shoot a gun? Mm -hmm. How do you go through a skirmishers? Uh, and it was, uh, it was a, you know, everybody took the same basic. And then after 14 weeks that I was telling you about, then you went on bivouac for two weeks. And that's what we were all ready to do. We were all lined up in that when they called me out uh, to tell me I wasn't going, that I was going to go to West Virginia University. So the first thing I did was run down to the phone to tell my mother that I wasn't going overseas. And, um, which is where the arrest of them were shipped. Right. Yeah. Uh, can you explain uh, bivouac a little bit? Like, what is it? Um, because I don't know what it is. I know what it stands for. Um, what? Bivouac. Uh, what is it? Stand? Oh, bivouac is where you go out and camp for two weeks. Oh. And it was so bad out there that half the company came off with either uh, pneumonia or flu or something. Mm -hmm. Um. Where did you know where you were supposed to be going before you were told that you weren't? No, 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 not at all. Oh, all they were doing was going to send you out to teach you how to camp without being in a barracks. Oh, <laughs> that's what it was, uh, which is the way most of the guys lived when mm -hmm. they were overseas in tents or foxholes or things like that, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that's what they were teaching us. Right. And so you never had to go overseas during no, the war? No, not at all, during the war. Mm -hmm. I did Tell the log story. What? The log story. Oh. <laughs> she was... One of the things we had to do was to uh, crawl under fire. You know, live bullets. So I was on this side waiting to go through and I looked out there because they shot a flare off mm -hmm. and here were a whole bunch of logs and I thought those dirty son of guns are making you crawl over logs and everything else but I did see a way to go around. So when I got in there I had to stay low because it was three foot is where the so you had to crawl. Mm -hmm. You couldn't stand up or you'd have got killed. But anyhow, I crawled around these so-called logs, came out the other end, and the guy said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Dog Company, D Company. He said, you know, you've got half a C Company is out there and won't move. So those logs were guys that were scared to death oh. <laughs> that were laying out there under that fire, scared to move. And I had crawled around a whole bunch of them. <laughs> so that was, that's what she was saying, telling the long story. Um, mm. And that was at training camp? That was at training camp, yes. That mm -hmm. was in infantry training. You had to crawl under this uh, live ammunition fire. 
Um, what other sorts of things did you have to do at training camp? Well, we, uh, first of all, we had to be conditioned, so you did a lot of physical exercises. They taught you, of course, how to march and obey commands and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they would teach you things that you had, to, you know, how to bandage a person. Not that you had, but in case you were in battle and no medics were around, why you could at least temporarily mm -hmm. do something. And they just taught you a whole over how to survive in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And then bivouac, of course, was a a trial of what did you learn, and now we're going to make you use it. You know? Right. So uh, they taught us how to how to bivouac and dig foxholes mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. Um, when you found out that you didn't have to go to bivouac, were you like, did you know what you were doing instead, or like, did yeah. they tell you right there? No, they told me right there then. Mm -hmm. I was going to go uh, to West Virginia University and study electrical engineering. Um, did they, like, did you ever find out why you were chosen? No. No. <laughs> no, because there was only four of us out of a thousand. Mm -hmm. But of course, all of them didn't take tests. In fact, I had one guy come up and tell me that uh, that I was screwy to waste a whole evening taking a test. <laughs> you know, that was his attitude. Mm -hmm. Not that I, I didn't drink, so I didn't go out drinking or anything. But, uh, and another attitude was a guy n next door, Bill Ingberg, came up to me and said he would give anything to trade me places. Mm. And the reason I'm saying that to you is because later on, I was in what was called ASTP, Army Training Program. Yes. I don't know, <laughs> but anyway, Army S is for some scholarship mm -hmm. or school or something. But anyhow, uh, later on I caught him telling people what a bunch of slackers ASTPers were in Rockford after the war. Mm -hmm. And I went up, well I felt sorry for him because he'd been paralyzed from the waist down by an 88. So maybe he was miserable anyhow, but uh, I reminded him what he said to me in Camp, uh, down there at Camp Robinson, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. So it was just an aside sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So then um, when you were told that you were going to Virginia instead of overseas, were you relieved? Or? West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah. Was I relieved? Yeah. Yes, very much. I was so relieved that I ran up and called my mother <laughs> to let her be relieved. <laughs> so, no, it, uh, I, I was very excited that I was going to get to go to engineering school. And I did, you went 12 weeks and got a week off, 12 weeks and a week off. I did that for three times. And then they folded the program. Interestingly, they had folded the program in March. And here I was in August, they were, or in December, they were redoing the program. Mm -hmm. And I went from December of 44 to December of 45. And then, of course, that VEJ was over with, VE and VJ Day both were over with, and the war was over with, and that's when they shipped me to, from there, West Virginia University, they wouldn't let us finish, to Camp Crowder, Missouri, where I was a clerk. Mm -hmm. Basically nothing but a clerk. Mm -hmm. Waiting for discharge is what I was doing. Until a major and captain came through. Mm -hmm. And then they stalled my discharge by an extra three months. Mm -hmm. I would have gotten out three months earlier if I had stayed at Camp Crowder. But, uh, um, out of curiosity, why did you um, not want to be in the reserves? Uh, because I didn't like the idea that uh, people had the right of life and death over you. Mm -hmm. And in the Army, that's true. Right. I mean, if they decided that 
you're to charge that thing even though it's going to, going to kill you, why you have no choice but to follow orders. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't like that kind of a power that somebody would have over me like that. Right. So uh, that was basically the reason mm -hmm. I didn't. Interestingly enough, the guys that were trying to get me in the reserve had to pick up and go to Korea. Oh. Because you, if you, you were born then, but what happened was that instead of sending the regular army to Korea, they called up all the reserves and shipped them. Mm -hmm. So all the guys that were telling me how wonderful it was to make all this money being in the reserves ended up going to Korea. Mm -hmm. And of course, since I wasn't in the reserves, I didn't end up going to Korea. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course, I was married and had a kid mm -hmm. by that time, so I wouldn't have gone anyhow. But uh, getting back to what you're saying on the, uh, I'm sorry I can't give you uh, much in the way of what happened during the Depression, because oh. <laughs> it really didn't seem to affect me that much. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't interested in uh, iPhones and, <laughs> you know, of that day, mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Right. Trying to put it in your language. <laughs> uh, we didn't have TV, we didn't, so the things that we had, we had mm -hmm. radios and, and you just did a lot of playing with your neighborhood friends mm -hmm. and uh, that was what you did when you came home from school, you didn't sit down at the computer and talk and text on the <laughs> phone and that sort of thing because you didn't have it. We probably would have if we'd had it, but we didn't have it. So I'm just saying there were a minimum of things to distract you. Right. So you had to learn to do things as a neighborhood mm -hmm. in order to keep yourself occupied. Kick the can mm -hmm. or tag or something like that, you know. I would doubt any of the kids play much kick the can or anything like that today. No. <laughs> you know, it just would be unheard of. Played a lot of baseball in the empty lots. I don't even know whether the kids do that much or not. Not really, no. But we, we did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, When you were um in New Mexico, did you guys play a lot? Like, did you guys like do sports like in your free time, or did you have a lot of free time? Was yeah, we something? had a lot of free time, but uh, I did most of it just playing cards, oh. pinochle or something like that. Mm -hmm. Was more what uh, we didn't play much sports out there mm -hmm. at all. So, because we were all trying to figure out how to get out. Right. You know, that was the main issue, was how do I get discharged? Mm -hmm. So, uh, not that I, I didn't have a bad job out there. Mm -hmm. It was kind of boring to sit there and adjust a receiver <laughs> so that they could send the message, and that, or they could receive the message. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so I didn't have a big job out there at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't have to go out in the desert and, right. and do that all day long in the hot sun because I was there from oh, June to August, mm -hmm. June, July, August. And then I came back and was uh, discharged. Mm -hmm. you know, honorably. Mm -hmm. I want you to be <laughs> honorable. So. Um. Um, but, while you were in West Virginia, the schooling there, was that in preparation for some sort of research or something for the Army? or No, I don't, I don't know why they, why they picked me. I mean, they, they don't, the Army doesn't tell you those things. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why they decide to send me to West Virginia University to study elect, electrical engineering except I qualified to study engineering and that's where they decided I was to go. Any more than you, 
they decide some people go to the infantry for replacement training and some people go to the Air Force or they go somewhere else, field artillery unit, you know what I mean? Yeah. But they don't tell you in the Army, they just send you. Um, so did you know though, if you had finished the schooling for electrical engineering, what would you have done with it? I told you that. You don't know how they would have oh. applied it? Well, well, how the Army would have handled it? Yeah. I, no, I have no idea. I didn't All know. I know is they closed they close the program in March, restarted in December, and closed it a year from December because the war was over. Mm -hmm. But uh, why all that happened, I, I, I have no idea. I don't even think the people that were our commanders had any idea. Uh, but it did, I guess the point was it did put me on a track that enabled me to have a career doing something that I really loved when at 22 I had no idea what career I wanted and what I wanted to love. So, but uh, I ended up, my job was handling a billion dollars worth of pur purchases worldwide, is what I did for an outfit called Sun Chemical, who made pigments and printing ink. They're the largest printing ink maker in the world, and the second largest pigment maker in the world. So uh, it was a, a very wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I worked until I was, when I, when I retired, my boss wouldn't let me retire. He made me be a consultant for 14 more years. <laughs> You know, buying aluminum. He said, Dick, I'm going to make you buy aluminum for the third time. Because I bought aluminum with Union Carbide and bought aluminum working for him. And then for aluminum we had for uh, um, wrapping around wires and that, that we had a plant that made aluminum for that purpose. Electric wires. So. Uh, no, it was a wonderful career as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And I was a very lucky person to fall into it. So. Um, I think we've covered everything. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for no, taking I, the time. I'm glad that, you know, I had the chance to give you experience that's a little unusual. Mm -hmm. of, because we came up in a different era. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, Love you. Thank you. And my wife and I have been married for 63 years, so wow. that's a plus. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. All right.